chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. So last week was Ascension Sunday, and we read from the Gospel of Luke. Luke um, writes also the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And um, in the Acts, we begin with the story of um, Pentecost only after we remember again the, um, the day of Ascension and that Jesus told the, the Apostles, wait for the power from on high to come on the day of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit coming. And so they waited. And there were, how many of them were waiting? Just the 12? Uh, or just the 11? So they had added one. In the meantime, they got together and they prayed over who should be um, the 12th disciple. And so Matthias was voted to be the, the 12th disciple. And But how many were there all together that day? 120. So we're not just talking about the 12 apostles. We're talking about the gathered community at that point already. So let's read. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Because each one of them was speaking his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we all hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter, Peter, the one who's messed up more times than we could probably count. When the power of the Holy Spirit hits him, listen to what he can do. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowds. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old will dream dreams. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on, in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. You yourselves know this man was handed over to you by God, set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it is impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him. I saw the Lord always before me because he was at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have been made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew what God had promised him on oath, that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. 
God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at the right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your seat, at your feet. Therefore let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, holy Lord, we thank you and we love you. We praise you for you are worthy of this and so much more. We honor you. We love you. We want to serve you. Fill us now with your Holy Spirit so that we might be about your work, your kingdom work. Open our eyes, God, through the power of your Spirit. Open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive all that you have for us. Thank you, gracious God. Amen. They were already gathered there, not just the apostles who were told to wait in Jerusalem when Jesus ascended into heaven in the town of Bethany, which is right outside of Jerusalem, near the home of his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he told the disciples, wait, wait until you have been filled from on high. I'm sending someone to be among you. And so they waited in Jerusalem. But they weren't the only ones in Jerusalem. It just so happens. Isn't it wonderful how things just so happen in the gospel and in the truth of Jesus Christ? It just so happened that it was yet another feast day in the Jewish faith. Remember that when Jesus was crucified, it just so happened that there were many gathered from many nations for the Feast of the Passover, where they remembered how God had led them out of slavery in Egypt into a land that was flowing with milk and honey. How God had done this for them. They celebrated the Passover, and how Jesus appropriated the Passover feast, and how now we don't celebrate Passover, we celebrate Easter, because the Lamb that has shed the blood to save the sins of the world, died on the cross, and we celebrate his resurrection. Thank you. Ah, that's why we're getting feedback. Thank you, baby. It's not because it's too close to my face. So they were all there. So Jesus reappropriated the Pentecost celebration and Easter and then, it was 50 days later, <clears throat> Penta, cost, Pentecost means 50. 50. 50 days later, it was already the celebration of Pentecost, a time when they celebrated Shobayat, which means the festival of the weeks. It was a celebration of the first harvest, a celebration of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, celebration of who the people were. And so, as you heard, they were Elamites, Arabs, Cretans, people from many different nations, all who celebrated the same faith, <clears throat> but spoke many different languages, who came to Jerusalem for that feast day, the Feast of Weeks, 50 days after Passover, 50 days after Easter for us. And on the day of Pentecost, they were gathered there. They just happened to already be there. 
we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Um, we think about sometimes people refer to the Spirit as a gentle comforter. Have you ever, and, and that happens sometimes, have you ever just felt the presence of the Spirit that made you, <sighs> remember the other week we learned when Jesus says peace, um, it's like those things that we've been wringing our hands over. Jesus brings peace into the midst of that. When we were talking about that peace of Jesus Christ, we remember that Jesus was already at work. He was already doing the thing. And as the apostles waited for the Holy Spirit to come, they waited for that comforter, the one that sometimes make us, makes us feel that, ah, peace. And so we think of the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the one who quiets our spirit, and sometimes that's the way it happens. But also, the day of Pentecost, the wind, the sound of the wind was violent. The people were bewildered, amazed, and perplexed. I don't know about you, but that sounds like anything to me but comforting. Like when I think of comforting, I think about mac and cheese. Ugh. You know, mashed potatoes with gravy. Oh, I always make things about food, don't I? Have you noticed that? <laughs> um, comfort. We talk about comfort foods. The Holy Spirit doesn't fill us with that kind of comfort, but the Holy Spirit does comfort, and, and that's how the word um, paraclete is sometimes translated. The Greek name for the Holy Spirit is paraclete. Say it with me, paraclete. paraclete. I don't know if you remember, but a number of years ago on Pentecost, I borrowed Gray Thacker's cleats. And I had him up here, and um, just to help us remember, it's a pair of cleats. Get it? Pair of cleats. And what do cleats do? Cleats make you feel the earth underneath your feet more fully. You're grounded better, and you can move better. That's what the Holy Spirit does, too, the paraclete. Paraclete is sometimes described as the comforter, sometimes described as the advocate. But the best description, I think, is the one who comes alongside us. Isn't that a great description of the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but I've had way too many experiences of trying to do things on my own and falling on my face because I didn't wait for the presence of the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside me. Sometimes uh, I miss the opportunities because I'm not paying attention to the work of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit's about to reveal something to me um, that um, really encourages me in my faith, I have to go back first and be reminded of something I didn't do that I was supposed to do and go back and fix that. And then somehow the gift of the Spirit em empowers me and encourages me in my faith. Isn't that awesome how that works? It's kind of like when you tithe. You think, uh, there's no way I can afford to give a tenth of my income. But then when you find out when you give, you have more. When you give of the Spirit of God, when you listen to the power of the Spirit of God, then you have more of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who comes alongside us. And so we need not feel lonely. We need not feel that we must be distressed and that the weight of the world is on our shoulders and it depends completely upon us. Because the Spirit is God with us. Another, we think of the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, but the Holy Spirit is also God with us. It's the one that Jesus sent to come alongside us. That comforts me. And yet it leaves me perplexed, amazed, and bewildered. How can God know? How can the Holy Spirit show up at just the right time? Because the Holy Spirit is the one, the paraclete, the one who grounds me, the one who shows up just in the right time so that I know what I'm supposed to do and when I'm supposed to do it because God speaks and God moves through the Holy Spirit. How many of you consider yourself flame-proof? What a great illustration, again, Andrew. Sometimes we, we think we're flame-proof or at least flame-retardant. Don't, don't let your hearts be that way today. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, much like God the Father and God the Son, 
doesn't force God's self on us. The Holy Spirit waits for us to say, come Holy Spirit. Oh, how we need you. So will you pray with me as we sing that chorus again? Come Holy Spirit, oh, how we need you. We don't need music. It's cool. Thank you. But will you let that be your prayer? Because the Spirit will come when you invite right alongside you. Stop falling on your face, beating yourself in the head, feeling lonely, abandoned, because you're not. God is still with you. Let's say it as a prayer. Come Holy Spirit, oh how on this day of Pentecost to make up our time. We, we pushed communion from last Sunday to this Sunday because of um, our wonderful um, eight graduates. And uh, it was awesome. I got to be at the graduation on Monday, see them make that next step into the next part of their life.